right. Well, good to see everybody here this evening, and uh, welcome to the midweek service. Pastor Aldrin drove up yesterday. He was in North Carolina. This is the first time he's been in the United States. He's uh, applied, I think, three or four times for a visa and was denied each time, and this time he got approved. And uh, he was in North Carolina, and he got his first experience with snow. They got hammered in North Carolina. I don't know if you saw that or not. Uh, certain Several folks that I know of, and uh, I mean in the Greensboro, Raleigh-Durham area, had nine inches of snow. And up in the mountains, they had a couple feet. And uh, so he got canceled both services Sunday. Then he drove up here. Now, remember, he's never driven in the United States either. And uh, in the Philippines, you kind of just make your own rules up. You, you can't do that in the United States, though some people seem like they try. And uh, he said, you know, he's got to remember to stay in the right lines and, you know, not just go anywhere he wants. Uh, and he, uh, I think he told me he drove 35 miles an hour from North Carolina up to here. And I thought, man, you made some friends along the way, I'm sure. <laughs> and a uh, long trip when you're driving slowly. But uh, he's here safely, and uh, we're glad he's here. And uh, give him a warm welcome now as he comes. Will you please? That's problem. Hello, hello, a blessed night to everyone. I thank to the Lord for this wonderful opportunity and privilege to be here. Thank you so much for Pastor Stan and your church. It's an honor and it's a privilege for me to be here. It's my first time here in your country. I'm Brother Aldrin Binuya, a missionary from Dingalan, Aurora, Philippines. They call me the purse. Filipino missionary astronaut landed in the Philippines. Like your astronaut, Boss Aldrins. I've been in pasturing for the past 10 years, and by the grace of God, I got saved by the ministry of saving grace of Jesus Christ through our faith last February 1, 2001. I thank to the Lord because my life before has no direction. I'm a drunkard. I'm a drug addict, but praise be to God, because of His saving grace, God changed my life for His glory. Before my family, they don't want me to attend the Baptist church. My parents, I experienced a lot of persecution when I became a Christian, but I stand up in the faith because of God's calling to me. And I thank to the Lord because May 5, 2005, I was attended in summer youth camp, and by the name of Pastor Mike Thomas, a friend, a, our guest speaker, he's an American missionary and pastor in North Carolina, I thank the Lord because I was surrendered my life to the Lord in full-time ministry, and I surrendered to preach. And I thank to the Lord because after that, my greatest desire is to serve and give all the glory to our God and serve Him. And I surrendered my life to the Lord. And I went to Bible College at Fundamental Baptist College for Asian. And after three years, I was able to finish my Bachelor of Arts in Theology at Fundamental Baptist College for Asian at Arlac City, Philippines. And I thank to the Lord, June 2008, the Independent Bible Baptist Church of Cabanatuan City under my pastor door, a missionary and his church surrender and they sending me to start a mission in Dingalan, Aurora, Philippines. And I praise God because that time I'm a 26 years old back then did not know anybody there not married and I thank to the Lord for a less than a hundred dollar support. I went to mission field. And I started the mission in Dingalan way back 2008. Every day I go for soul winning. I go for Bible study. I go for reaching those children for Christ and feed them. I am the pastor. I am the preacher. 
I am the song leader, I am the musician, I am the janitor, I am the driver. It's hard because I'm just alone. But knowing that the Lord is with me and understood clearly that the Lord is wanted me to preach in this place. And I thank to the Lord because after six months in the ministry in Dingal and Aurora, God answered my prayer. In Genesis 2.18, it is not good for a man to be alone. And God gave me a beautiful wife and her name is Jesusa Esbinuya. And God bless us three cute little kids named Nehemiah, Samuel, and Faith. I'm so blessed by God because I have Jesus in my heart and I have Jesusa as my wife. And truly, God is so blessed to my life. And as a servant of Jesus Christ, I thank to the Lord because before I'm a sinner, but now I'm a sinner saved by His grace. I was called and I was surrendered my life to the Lord and I was separated by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I thank to the Lord, I would like to present to you the ministry of God entrusted to us and truly, God is saving in His uh, ministry of saving souls in Dingalan Aurora. Dingalan Aurora is a beautiful place. It's in the northeast part from Manila. It consisted of 28,000 population with 11 villages. And I thank to the Lord because now, by the grace of God, God saves lost people in our place. I would like to present to you our ministry in Dingalan, Aurora, Philippines. To God be the glory. Good day to everyone. I'm Alvin Binuya, Senior Pastor of Independent Bible Baptist Church of Dingalan, Aurora. Dingdalan is a town in Aurora laid between the Sierra Madre mountain range and the Pacific Ocean on the west part of Luzon. It is consisted of 11 villages with a population of 28,000 residents. Fishing is the main industry of this town. Along with its tourism and other opportunities of works for its citizens. The town has been blessed for its great natural resources and people's simple way of life. But there has been little effort for the spread of the gospel. This burden made me and my family start a ministry here in Dingalan. Through the help of my sending church, IBBC Kabanatuan, we came and started our first work way back 2008 in the village of the Bilda We managed to win families for Christ and late October that year, we started our first service on the floor of the house of the family we first ministered. We also held our services most of the time under the mango tree. Years went by and by God's grace, more souls came to know Christ and became our members. As our ministry expanded into different barangays, years went by and some of our members were touched by our ministry and donated a lot for our future church building, which was granted by Project Nehemiah, a church building program. Now the church is truly really blessed with different ministries. We continue to knock doors and win more souls.
Conduct house to house Bible studies. Encouraging our youth to serve the Lord and other opportunities in service. Our work has been extended to the government services of our town, including Bless Our Cups and Soldiers Ministry, Bible study with the beauty of fire protection, anti-illegal drug campaigns campus and hospital ministries As the present provides, we are having our visions in the year 2020 that we could empower our church planting here in Dingala. We are praying to plant five churches in the different villages, thus extending the spread of the gospel to our citizens and to reach other souls who need to hear the plan of salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are glad for you to be here in our church. We pray that you will be blessed by our ministry and looking forward that you could be a part of us. Thank you and may God bless you here in IBBC, Dingala. We praise the Lord because before, it is just a vision. We are praying to plant five churches by the year 2020. And by the grace of God, we have now three independent Bible Baptist churches in our town. Since 2008, we started the first church in village of Paltik, Dingalan, Aurora. In year 2012, way back 2012, we started the second church. It is located in the top of the mountain. And we praise the Lord because last January 2018, Pastor Stan is there winning souls for Christ. And it is the fruit of the drug transformation ministry in our town and now. In that village of Butas Nabato, we have three families that are before our drug-affected families. But now, they are serving the Lord our God because God saves those drug addicts and now they are serving in the Lord. And I thank to the Lord because now, we are just a sinner before. We are just like them. We are not doing it 
good. We are all sinner, but by the grace of God, He was called us. Now we are servant of Jesus Christ. We are called by God, and we are separated by the gospel of Jesus Christ. He cleanses us. He uses us for His glory, and we thank the Lord because by the grace of God and because of the grace of this gospel, God changes us for His glory. And we thank to the Lord because now I'm going back to the Philippines, maybe two months from now, and I'm ready to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Please continue to pray for us. My friend, members of this church, pastors and missionary, we are doing a great work for the Lord. The work is great and I can do it alone. We need your prayers. We need your help. We need your support. We need your love for the lost souls. We need your love for those children that they need the gospel. And we are here. This is my first time here, to, here in your country. It is be, it, your church being a blessing to us when pastors stand Win souls to that place and praise the Lord by His by the word of God when He preaches. There's somebody who received the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And we're doing a great work. Brother, you're doing a great work for the Lord. Every support, every sacrificial that you're doing for the Lord, you're doing that for the glory of God. And now, please pray for us. We are praying for 40 individuals or churches that has the heart to support $25 monthly for my family and for my ministerial support. I also supporting three pastors. Because of that three village church, I can't do it alone. I can preach to the three churches. And now, by God's grace, we have two pastors in our church and we're supporting them $50 monthly but still serving in the Lord. Church, don't stop. I know you have a big heart. You have a lot of sacrifices for the missionaries and mission in the Philippines. But this one thing I sure for you, I will do my best by God's grace to use every blessing that we receive for the glory of God. And you can also extend your heart to support also for our church project this year. We are praying for church lot property for us to put a transformation center that we can use for drug surrenders ministry for family as we are as our family center and our, our cinders our uh, children's center feeding program and we can use that place. And now, by the grace of God, we already have $2,000 and we are in need of $6,500 for us to buy that lot property, for us to have, mo again, a church lot plus a transformation center for the drug surrenderies. That is a 500 square meter lot. And I challenged my people before I came here to your country. Church, we're doing sacrificial giving in our church. Let us pray to God that God will use us for His ministry. And while I'm in the U.S., you're doing your part as a member of the church. By God's grace, two weeks ago, we have now $2,000 sacrificial giving. But that's all. But the price of the lot is 8500 and I'm still praying to God for one-time giving. If you have the heart to, to be a part of that lot that we put a transformation center, $500, I'm praying for 13 person or individual or church that are willing to give one-time giving at $500 for that lot. And I will assure you, when I come back this March, we will buy that lot because... Truly, the, the three village churches, all of that are only by God's grace. The first lot, I denied you 2009 for almost four and a half years, Lord. We worship 
in that mission house. We worship under the tree for any four and a half years. And Lord, can I apply to your to US for me to to raise the money for my lot? But but God answers. I denied. Your consul in the United in, in, in the Philippines. I was denied that time. And you know, after five days, God answered my prayer. One of the members donated a lot for future church lot building. That's why we started worship under the tree. For almost less than a year, we worship under the tree to our God. But you know, I, I, I apply again in, in your U.S. Embassy in the Philippines. And year 2010, I was denied again. And after a month, God gave us building. And I'm the one of the beneficiary of Project Nehemiah, the church building program. And you know, the second church building, I tried it again to apply. And I was denied. The same story. But you know what happened? The second church building, Pastor Jess Kawili gave us building in, 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 located in, in Mountain Sierra Madre Mountain Range and put a camp. Could you be our partners in that camp? And I said, yes, Pastor. I will give you a building for your second building. And you know, last January, after the owner of the resort his, her son is drug addict also. She said to me, Pastor, I want to donate a lot, a 366 square meter for your work in Butas Nabato, the third church building. And praise be to God! Because another building came. And you know, God just somebody. For the past 10 years, I'm so sorry for my hilly billy accent. I try my best to communicate. But I thank to the Lord because God used me for His glory. It is not my story. It is not just my ministry. It is not about myself and my family. It is about God's story in the ministry in the Philippines. And you can be a part of that. Let us win souls. Don't stop serving the Lord. And keep doing for the glory of God. I would like to give a song. This song is to God be the glory. That all things is comes from God. And it is for the glory of God. How can I say thanks for the things that you have done for me? Being so undeserved, yet you gave to prove your love for me. The voices of a million angels could not express my gratitude. All that I have, whatever hope to be, I hold it all to Thee, to God. Glory to God, be the glory to God, be the glory for the things He has done with His blood. He has saved. Far, he has raised me to God be the glory for the thing he has done. Just let me be 
my life. Lord, I'll be pleasing, Lord, to Thee, and to Thy gain any praise. Lead me to the car. sa kanyang pag-ibig sa dugo niyang tumigis sa lako ay lininis ang Diyos ay purihin sa kanyang be the glory. All right, take your Bible if you would please, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, can you hear me all right? Oh, can you? Okay, I've been, I'm still got a bit of congestion and so sometimes my ears aren't hearing what I think they ought to hear, as long as you can hear it's good. If uh, somebody grabs some water, can you get a uh, from the Fellowship of Paul, a bottle of water. Nathan, will you get that for me, please? Thank you. Our water people didn't show up tonight, so uh, a little dry this evening, all right? Okay, Second Timothy chapter 2, verse number 24, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture now. And Lord, as we open up your word tonight, I pray that you would minister to each of us as only you can. Holy Spirit of God, open our understanding. Uh, give us the illumination that we need that will understand your word exactly the way you intended it to be understood. Speak to each heart tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Somebody said truth is not absolute. Truth is only relative. To which somebody asked him, are you absolutely certain about that? And he said, absolutely. <laughs> then you have absolute truth. You know, you, you, can, you can chuckle at that, that if someone says there's no absolute truth, are you sure about that? Absolutely. Uh, then... It's not so funny when you realize that that's really what Satan's been trying to do for a long, long time. Uh, he's tried to get people to believe ever since the Garden of Eden that truth is not absolute. That truth is not absolute, that it's not identifiable, that it's not reliable, that truth changes. He said when, God, when Eve said, God said, we eat of this tree, will surely die, what did he say? You won't surely die. See? God didn't really mean that. God didn't really, that isn't what he was talking about. In fact, the sad truth is, you find that the, in almost any survey among Christians, I mean those who profess faith in Jesus Christ, they don't believe that there's any such thing as absolute truth. I mean something, the truth that applies to all situations in in, in, in every situation and every time, time frame. Now, it's, it's just as frightening how successful Satan has been 
to get people in his snare to believe that truth is relative. The Bible doesn't teach that. Sometimes when we say we're a Bible-believing Baptist church, people say, well, aren't all of them? And, and the sad truth is, no. I, I wish we could say that. But everyone, not everyone, and you'll see as we unfold this a little bit tonight, everybody understands or believes the absolute authority of the Bible. Uh, when we say the Bible is our authority, that means we believe every word in the book. And it has authority in our life. Now this isn't from the faucet, is it? Thank you. It's from where? The water fountain? Oh, Nathan. All right. Ah! We got to... That's, it's fine. It's fine, Terry Lynn. That's okay. It's okay. I'll, I'll survive. There we go. Bottled water. What we're talking about. Leland, where did this come from? Thank you. That's great. All right, look at your paper this evening, if you will. Number one, here's what we have. The truth is absolute and unchanging. The truth is absolute and unchanging. In contrast to Satan's lies, Jesus Christ came and proclaimed truth. And He said, the truth can be known. He said in John 8, 32, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. He said in John 17, 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And so Jesus taught us that there is absolute truth. In fact, He made it clear He was the truth. We tell folks when they come to the RU program that the truth will make you free. And the truth isn't something, the truth is someone. And that truth is Jesus Christ. And He's the one who can make you free. So we know this, A, truth, absolute truth, is found in the Bible. Truth can be found in the confines of God's Word. And that's why every attack by Satan ultimately is attack against the Bible. It's an attack against God's Word. If the Bible's not authentic, if it's not the inspired Word of God, then it does not have to have authority in our life. And so the devil's been very successful at getting our society and even churches in a position where the Bible, as the truth of God, is not as widely accepted as it once was. Jesus said, look at John 8 and verse 44, would you please? John 8 and verse number 44. It's an important verse you ought to be familiar with. John 8 and verse 44. Jesus said, Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So we know that he's a liar, but there's something else that, that sticks out here. Notice it says he was a murderer from the beginning. You think, well, what in the world was Satan murdering from the beginning? I'll tell you what he was murdering. He was murdering the truth. That's why there's no truth in him. That's what, yea, hath God said. That's what that was all about. Trying to get him to doubt the truth and the authority of God's Word. You know, when people are in the snare of Satan, the snare of the devil, as 2 Timothy speaks about, when they've been taken captive by him at his will, it has warped their mind. It has it is made them unable to think clearly. They cannot discern. We talked about last, last week, remember? 
they're, 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 un they're unstable in all their ways. They can't determine what's right and what's wrong. They can't determine what's true and what's not true. They, they, the, uh, the authenticity and the authority of God's Word has been under attack for history, throughout history. What we have seen in our generation, in my generation, that has really come on the scene and has tried to destroy people's faith in the Word of God is, is uh, evolution and the teaching of Charles Darwin. It's not a, evolution is not just a secular philosophy. It's a religious belief system, just as much as Christianity is. It depends on faith, but not in God. Faith in billions and billions of years. And that, that through that process, some magical process, things changed and, and evolved into what we see today. And that takes a lot of faith. But you understand, that belief in evolution and Darwinism and his teachings has... has uh, listen, if that's true, the Bible can't be true. You can't get those two to coexist. And so it's caused people not to want to believe the Word of God. It is completely opposite to what God's Word teaches. There's only one, to me it's so simple, there's one person there when everything was started, and that was God. Why don't we just listen to what He said? We have an eyewitness, uh, and that was God. And so we'll listen to what He has to say about it. But you understand, if, 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 if the truth they have is man-centered, and it is, then there's no God, there's no Creator, there's no author and finisher, there's no judge, then man becomes his own authority, man becomes his own source of truth, truth is just relative. That's where people begin to say, well, you know, I, I, I can't tell you you're wrong in doing that, I wouldn't do that, but I can't tell you you're wrong in doing that. See, this is relative. It's okay if, if for him to do it, I won't do it, or it's okay for me to do it, but you shouldn't do it, and it's, it all depends on the individual. There is no hard and fast truth, right or wrong. And so, when that happens, any form of behavior can be justified. We're, we're seeing that in our society. It used to be just the, uh, you know, now, now I, I can't even tell you all the letters of the alphabet that they want us to accept as far as someone's, you know, uh, sexual orientation. L, B, G, Q, X squared, Z. And I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be funny. There, there's all kinds of letters after this because what is it? You, you can't tell somebody they're wrong. See? Because everyone's doing right in their own eyes. Any form of behavior becomes justified because there is no absolute truth. But we know that absolute truth is found in the pages of the Bible. And that gives us number B. The Bible, then, must be our absolute authority. The Bible is our absolute authority. I was reading some literature. It was about a, a small group Bible study discussion, and uh, the writer was writing. And again, this is not an unsafe person. It's a safe person. And he's writing, and he's recommenda recommendations for people who are leading these discussions said that when you... Uh, read a portion of Scripture then, ask the group, go around the group and ask each one of them, what does this mean to you? Now, I understand. He probably was just trying to get everybody involved. But can I tell you something? That's a horribly wrong approach to Scripture. Does truth change according to how I feel about it? See? We're, we're getting what, how I feel and what I think involved in it. No, what, what do you, you know what, when you gather together, sometimes people come to me and say, you know, why don't you have, you know, uh, more interaction? Listen, you don't come to church for us to find out what you know about the Bible. You're coming to church to find out what God says about His Word. And I'm going to tell you what God says about His Word. And I'm here to teach you, and that's why God gives the church pastors and teachers. And, you know, you ever think about Jesus when He taught? The Bible says he taught so differently because he taught as one having authority, not as one of the scribes. He taught with authority. And what he meant was he was, he was certain of the authority of the Scriptures that he taught. He didn't, he didn't mealy mouth it around and he didn't talk tentatively. He didn't, Jesus never one time 
uh, taught something and then said, now, well, or, or he, didn't, he never quoted an Old Testament scripture and then said, now, tell me what that means to you. Okay? Jesus didn't do that. Truth is truth. And, and, and you know, don't, he didn't say, Jesus never said, now, I'll quote you the Old Testament here, but of course that was a different day and time. It doesn't really apply to our day and age. Today, you understand. Uh, truth, when we say truth is absolute, we mean truth never changes. We mean the Word of God never changes. Because we are people today, well, I know the Bible says that, but you know, we're in the 21st century, preacher. Like I wasn't aware what century we're living in. And by the way, I'm not stuck in the 18th century or the 19th century. I'm still stuck in the 1st century when God's Word was given. All right? And we want to be true to the Word of God. Once truth becomes relative and there's no absolute truth, then you're unable to have stability in your life. The truth in God's Word stabilizes you and, and keeps you from being double-minded in all your ways. John who wrote the book of Revelation, we know was the last of the apostles to die. He was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. And that's where he wrote the book of Revelation. Before he died on, before he was in, in, even in exile on Patmos, John trained two men to carry on his work. Their names were Ignatius and Polycarp. For many years, they were leaders of the church. Under one of the Roman emperors, a great persecution arose and Ignatius was taken to Rome and had an audience before the emperor. The Roman ruler offered to spare his life as if Ignatius would offer a sacrifice to the Roman gods in a public demonstration of his loyalty to the empire. Ignatius refused because truth to him was not negotiable. He was taken into the Colosseum thrown into the arena with the starving wild beasts in front of a sold-out crowd who got their entertainment from watching Christians get eaten alive. Polycarp was ordered to curse Christ, but he refused. He was also taken into a stadium in front of a bloodthirsty mob. Before his execution, he said this, quote, Eighty-six years I have served him and he has never once wronged me. How then shall I blaspheme my king who has saved me? And they burned Polycarp at the stake at that very spot. Truth is worth fighting for. And if you read church history, you'll find out truth is worth dying for. Truth. You know, you, I was reading where a pastor had a conversation with a woman on an airplane, he had been reading his Bible and that struck up a conversation. And as he talked to her, she didn't believe anything she said. In fact, she said to him, well, that's all right for you if you think you need something to make you feel better. But I choose not to believe that. And he said, well, you can choose not to believe that or to believe it, but it doesn't change the fact that it's true. It's true whether you want to believe it or not. And there'll be a doubt. In fact, he said, there'll come a day when you will believe it. You understand, there'll come a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One day they'll bow. You understand, the devil loves it when people think truth depends on them rather than on God and His Word. Because when he gets you there, he has you in his snare and you don't even know it. I want to talk to you briefly about a thing that has come up in the last 10 or 15 years. It's called an emergent church or the emerging church. There's some writers that have written books and sold millions of copies. Leaders in that movement. And their belief is truth is relevant. Truth is not absolute. One of them wrote, We do not think our movement is about changing your worship service. We do not think it's about how you structure your church staff. This is actually about changing your theology. This is about our belief that theology 
must change to keep up with society. In other words, the method must not only change, but the message must change. That's, that's not unsaved people saying that. These are professing Christians teaching this. These are where people go to church. Another one wrote, I must add, I don't believe that making disciples must equal making adherence to the Christian religion. It may be advisable in many circumstances to make people followers of Jesus and yet remain within their Buddhist, Hindu, or Jewish context. That's, that is so far contrary to what Jesus Christ taught, it just about, I need duct tape to hold my head together. It's unbelievable. These are people who are influencing the church, God's people, to abandon the truth. You say, well, Pastor, we're all seeking truth. No, we're not. I found the truth. I know where the truth is. I'm not seeking it. I've got it right here, and so do you. In the pages of your Bible. I want to learn it more about it. I want to understand it better. But it's found within the pages of the Word of God. And it's found, obviously we believe here, it's found within the pages of the King James Bible. That's been solid for 400 years. None of one of their writers who's not even, I don't think, pastoring anymore. Because he got in trouble for not believing there was hell. He said this, the, the Christian faith is mysterious to the core. It's about things that ultimately cannot be put into words. Language fails. If we do definitely put God into words, we have at that very moment made God something that God is not. And I, I scratch my head. God gave us His words. God gave us His words to let us know Him. You're not going to know God apart from His words. Why would God give us the Bible at all if you can't convey truth with words? It's, it's, I think He's lost His mind. No wonder... Listen, if that's what they believe, no wonder there's so little authoritative Bible preaching anymore. So little authoritative, thus saith the Lord anymore in our churches today. No wonder there's an hour and a half of music in a 12-minute sermonette. They don't believe the Word of God. No wonder people have doubt and confusion and, and have no power in their life. Everything about God and God's nature speaks to absolutes. The sun is coming up tomorrow morning. If the Lord doesn't come back, it's coming up. Okay? That's an absolute. Okay? Not going to change. It comes up in the east and sets in the west. You've heard me say so many times, sunrise east, sets in the west, two plus two is four, water runs downhill. And I go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. That's the way it works. You settle that, settle that in your heart. The church is supposed to be the foundation, the pillar and ground of the truth. In other words, if you can't get God's truth at the church, where are you going to get it? 1 Timothy 3.15, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The pillar and ground is what holds the building together. What happens when the church loses its bearings, when it loses its commitment to the Bible as being absolutely true? I'll tell you what happens. It all falls apart. Not just the church, but society. Our society and our country is in the shape it's in because our churches are so weak and anemic. Once you open the door and truth becomes relative, you have nothing left upon which to stand. The Bible says, remember, what we're talking about tonight is this. Look, verse 25 of 2 Timothy 2, If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Acknowledging of the truth. If there's no truth to acknowledge then how do you escape the snare of the devil? You don't. 
That's where you say. And you end up being destroyed by him. Sadly, that's where our country is. You have to, we have to have a standard by which we judge our life and our actions. And we have that standard. It's God's word. Acts 17, the, the, the ones in Berea, it said, these, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica and that they searched the Scriptures daily whether these things were so. The Bible is the absolute truth of God by which we make our life decisions. And we make everyday decisions. We make the proper decisions of life. It's reliable. We need to study it. We need to rightly divide it. We need to memorize it. We need to meditate in it. There'll always be those who will deny the truth. There'll always be those who will seek us to not obey the truth. But that path always leads us to slavery, bondage, to the snare of Satan. Every single time. We've, had it, we've said it so often, the devil always promises freedom, but he only gives you slavery. Bondage. Because he is a liar. There is no truth in him. The devil is a liar. The only people who have freedom are the ones who submit themselves to the absolute truth of God's Word. That's why principle number one, when the addicts come to Reformers Unanimous, principle number one, if God is against it, so am I. See, you have to come to where, let the, the first verse they memorize. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord. Are you willing to forsake your way? Are you Are willing to forsake your thoughts? Are you willing to say, if God says it's wrong, it's wrong. If God says it's right, it's right. Uh, there's got to be some absolute truth in my life and it's not me. It's got to be God's Word. And that's not just good for a drug addict. That's not just good for a drunkard. That's good for every single person on the face of the earth. There's more than 140 references in the Bible, in the Old and New Testaments, which describe God's Word as truth. Not one verse that casts any doubt on the accuracy, authenticity, or authority of the Word of God. Not one promise has ever failed. Not one statement has ever proven false. You can fully rely on every single statement in the Bible. You can rely on every word in the Bible. God, God doesn't give. Remember years ago, Ted Turner of the, said uh, he didn't like the Ten Commandments. He referred to them as the Ten Suggestions. You understand, God doesn't give suggestions. God gives commandments. Commands to be obeyed. God never said, God never said, I want to make a suggestion to you. And when the preacher stands up, the preacher shouldn't say, I'd like to suggest to you, you could do this. The preacher shouldn't stand up and say, I'd like to suggest you must be born again. No, uh, the preacher ought to stand up and say, you must be born again. And, and make sure it's a command and not a suggestion. You're not here to get my opinion. You're here to get God's Word and what the Bible says. You pair Scripture with Scripture and rightly divide the Word of Truth. There's many today, and we, we run into it in the prison all the time, people trying to find a, a new Bible that will be easier to understand. It's amazing. By the way, you have to understand, I, I've been around this, I've been, I've been in this rodeo for a while. Okay? I've seen them all come down the pike. I have heard the phrase, it's so much easier to understand. You'll just read it and immediately you'll understand it. I've heard that phrase for 40 years, 50 years. Every new version that comes out, that's what they say. And if that were true, wouldn't we have the most literate, Bible-believing, Bible-obeying society we've ever had in the, in the whole world? Yet we have more people ignorant of God's Word than we ever have had in the history of America. While we're supposed to have all these easy-to-read Bibles. I'll just stick to the old book. 
I'll just stick to the old book. Get yourself a Webster 1828 dictionary and look up the words and study to show yourself approved unto God. Ask the Holy Spirit of God who indwells you to help you understand His Word. He will guide you into all truth. John 16, 13. Let, let God's truth be your standard, not what you think. It'll free you. And it'll help you be able to recover others from the snare of Satan. Now, let me give you number two. Truth must be acknowledged. There's a difference between knowing the truth and acknowledging the truth. Now, you have to know the truth for you to acknowledge it. But I want you to know there's a difference. Because you can know the truth and yet not acknowledge the truth. Now, understand, it's an awful thing not to know the truth. There are billions in the world who don't know the truth at all. They've never heard of Jesus Christ. They've never heard the Gospel. And that's sad to never have heard the truth. But I tell you what's worse is to have heard the truth and not acknowledge the truth. To know the truth, but not live the truth. The Bible is like a key. Jesus spoke to the lawyers and rebuked them for not applying what they knew about the Bible. You can't acknowledge truth without first coming to know the truth. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. You're right there in chapter 2. Do you notice verse 1? This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, describing the United States of America, isn't it? having a form of godliness, look, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such, turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Never able to grow to know the knowledge of the truth. Continually learning, but never gaining knowledge of the truth. Never ever coming to know the meaning or apply the knowledge. We know that when we get saved, we're likened to babies. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word that you can grow thereby. And we know what we need to grow is God's Word. If you don't have God's Word, there's no way you're going to grow as a Christian. So, you may not have a lot of knowledge when you start. That's okay. You'll get knowledge. You continue to desire His Word and to read His Word and to hear His Word taught and preached. But don't stay. Don't, don't. You start without a lot of knowledge, but don't stay there. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Knowing Christ and knowing His Word is the key. If you don't have Christ, you're never going to understand His Word. You're spiritually discerned. So he's the key, but you understand, you have to use the key. No one else can, you, you can look at the key and admire the key and know all about the key, but the truth is you have to use the key to unlock the door. You can study knowledge, you can study the key, you can learn all the different things about the key, but it doesn't unlock the door until you take the key and unlock the door. When you get to know God and you get to know His Word, you have to take the next step, and that is acknowledge His truth. If you don't do that, you fall short.
We're to take the knowledge we learn from God's Word and use it. The Bible, obviously, is filled with information about all areas of life. It tells us how to be good parents, good spouses, good employees, good Christians, etc., etc. But knowing what it says about all that doesn't change us. Doing it changes us. Using the key to acknowledge the truth changes us. Acknowledging doesn't mean I'm nodding my head saying, yeah, that's true. That's not what acknowledging means. Acknowledging means this, coming into an agreement with the truth. It's when we say that's true and I'm going to use the key to unlock it. I'm going to believe what God says in His Word. I'm going to implement it in my life. When we take the step and we use the key, in other words, we're doing it in Christ's power, not our power. We're doing it in His strength, not our strength. Then God unlocks the door. God unlocks the door. And you know what you find out? No matter how much you want to, you cannot use your key to the Bible for somebody else. They have to have their own key. And they have to use it. You see, in recovery ministry, sometimes you want it worse than they do. You want to see them get victory more than they want to have victory. And, and, it, and it, you can't give it to them. They have to want it. And they have to be able to get it for themselves. You can give people the key. We give them the knowledge of Christ. We give them Christ. And they receive Him as their Savior. But they have to turn that key in their own life. We can't do it for them. Now if they don't, then you cannot continue. You're only going to get, you're only going to get worse. A, underneath this. Let me, let me help you understand that. Truth not acknowledged will take you deeper into bondage. Truth not acknowledged will take us deeper into bondage. Truth makes us free, but truth we don't apply to our lives will take us deeper into bondage. The consequences of knowing God but refusing to acknowledge Him are catastrophic. Romans 1 talks about how they knew God but they didn't acknowledge Him as they didn't like to retain him in their knowledge. The longer you refuse to act on what you know is God's truth, the deeper into bondage you'll plunge. That's what it means in Romans 1.18 when it says, they hold the truth in unrighteousness. Romans 1.18, they hold the truth in unrighteousness. It literally means they suppress or they hold the truth down. In unrighteousness. In other words, they know the truth, but they don't act on it. They continue to live in an unrighteous way. And when that happens, you're headed for perilous times. Remember when Jesus sent them out to preach, He told them that those who don't listen those who refuse to hear the truth, did it be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the Day of Judgment than for those people, than for that city? Now, we understand the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were wicked people. And without a doubt, they went to hell. Fire and brimstone came down upon them. But their lack of knowledge, their lack of knowledge of the truth, their, their punishment according to Jesus will be less than those who knowingly reject the truth. It'll be better, listen, it'll be better for the people in Sodom and Gomorrah than for the people who grew up in church and heard the Bible taught every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, and then they turned their back on it. 
and live unrighteously. God said it will be more tolerable for them than it will be for you. Peter says a similar thing. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2, would you please? We'll be wrapping it up here. 2 Peter chapter 2. The Bible says in verse 21, For it had been better, 2 Peter 2, 21, For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, then, after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is, return, is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Now, this is kind of gross, but it's reality. How many of you have a dog? Ever had a dog? Okay. If you let it, dog gets sick and you don't watch him, he'll go right back and start lapping up his own vomit. They do it. It's pretty gross. But it's, it's an illustration the Lord gives for the person who knows the truth, had the key to change their life, and they refused it. Refused to use it. They need repentance, they need to be turned around, but instead, they go back to the awful, disgusting mess of their sin. We, we look at it and we think, gross, man, how can you do that? But the dog think it's the greatest thing in all the world. Clean a hog up. He says the sow is washed and, and was washed and turned her wallowing in the mire. You can wash that hog, you know, get that hog, wash it up, clean it up, but that hog, when it gets out, it's going right back to the mud hole. That's its nature. The mud is comforting to them. It, the mud doesn't make them change anything. It's filthy and it's dirty, but guess what? It's comfortably filthy and dirty to them. That's what's comfortable. But there's another negative impact to refusing to turn that key of knowledge and, and acknowledge the truth. That, and that is this, it destroys relationships with those who are in the truth. That, that hog that wants to go back in the mire, you know what? It really doesn't care if anybody around them stinks or not. They're, they're not very particular. Your dog, your dog doesn't really care if you have bad breath or not. You probably care if he does. But a person who wants to be clean and wants to be righteous doesn't want anything to do with the mud. That's why, look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 again, back to where we were. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And remember what the Lord said about these creeps in verse number 6? It says, remember it says, these are they which lead, were they which creep into houses? These are creepy characters. Notice verse 5. Here's what you do. They have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. What's the last four words? From such turn away. B there underneath your outline is simply we must turn away from those who refuse the truth. You're not going to hug the hog without getting mud on yourself. That's why he told them to turn away. Why do you turn away? Because they are going to be a bad influence on you. You won't pull them up, they'll pull you down. That's always the case. Always the case. Those who are in captivity always try to take others with them. They know they're not right. They know they're not using the key. But rather than 
work for their freedom and in, they, they, they turn and encourage others to join them. Misery loves company. If you spend much time with people who are unrepentant over their sin, then you're on the road to being ensnared as well. Turn away. Turn away. If you're in the snare this evening, don't rest content about just coming to church and learning more about God. Make sure you're responding to the truth that you've learned. Using the key of Jesus Christ. You have to take what you learn and apply it to your life and say, I'm going to live what I've learned. Or I'm endangering myself to be in the snare of Satan. You see, now that you know the truth, you have a decision to make. What are you going to do about it? Whenever you come to church and you hear the truth, you have a decision to make. What am I going to do about it? Am I going to obey this? Am I going to ignore it and do what I want to do anyway? Repentance is not just something you do when you get saved and you never do it again the rest of your life. Repentance is a changing of your mind where, where you change the way you think about something. And that happens over and over and over again as you grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As you learn the truth, you continually change the way you think. When you take the key and then you lock the knowledge of God's Word and the acknowledging of God's Word, then you unlock the door to freedom in your future. We learn the Bible so we can live the Bible. Knowledge just puffs up. Okay? Okay? You're not just learning it to, to say, hey, I, I look at all the Bible I can quote. God's not interested in the Bible you can quote. He is interested in the Bible you can live. Jesus said, if you know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Don't be just a hearer of the Word. Be a doer. And we'll talk about next week about recovering themselves out of the snare of the devil. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. Thank you, God, for preserving your Word for us and allowing us to have copies in our hand tonight. And Lord, I pray that it would be a book that we look to every single day. That it will be authoritative in our life. And I pray, God, that we would not just know the truth, we would acknowledge the truth. That, Lord, your Word would have the authority and we would be obedient to the Bible we know. That we would not be taken captive and into the snare of the evil one. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord. Be with Pastor Aldrin as he travels on. I pray you'll prosper his time here in the United States. Watch over him and keep him safe as he navigates the winter weather. But Lord, impress upon other churches like you have ours tonight. That, Lord, they'll partner with him and reaching souls for Christ there in the Philippines. Lord, prosper his way here, please. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.